One, they were seeing in fully a third of their patients, they were histologically detecting spike protein in gut after six months, which I mean, it could be debris, but that's a long that's time, a long time for, yeah. for debris to last. And, but then what I thought was the most compelling evidence for a live reservoir of virus is they they sample convalescent plasma from patients in a longitudinal fashion. Then they used that to try to neutralize specific strains of the virus, mostly wild type, and then a combination of two antigenic escape mutations. And they found that initially the patient's convalescent plasma did not neutralize the antigenic escape mutations, but then after four to six weeks, it did, suggesting that, um, you know, in my mind, the only way that makes sense is if there is a pool of virus that is under selective pressure to escape the host antibodies. Um, sure. I mean, I, I sadly missed Pell's talk, so I definitely need to go back and. Okay, so just for the last minute or so, what I want to tell you about is some very recent data that we found having individuals come back to Rockefeller at six months after we initially cloned antibodies for them. Those antibodies had very low levels of somatic mutation. These are no number of mutations in the heavy chain and light chain of antibodies uh, about a month after they were infected. Six months later, the number of mutations has clearly increased. The antibodies clearly are evolving or have evolved over that period of six months. And some of them have evolved in quite interesting ways. So here is an antibody, C144. It's one of our favorite antibodies that's going forward in clinical development. And I've already told you about resistance mutations uh, that can be selected uh, with that antibody. And we find that those mutations that we can generate in cell culture and also exist naturally confer complete resistance to this antibody. Now, what has happened in this individual is that this antibody has evolved and there are several uh, derivative variants. Here's one of them. So it's the same antibody, just with more somatic mutations. That antibody has clearly evolved and now can actually neutralize those previously uh, resistant variants. So it's clear that over time, the antibody response is maturing and perhaps broadening to include uh, virus variants that otherwise might resist that initially generated close to germline antibody. And some very remarkable uh, uh, data from a collaborator, uh, Saurabh Mahandru, might uh, give some clues as to how this is happening. Uh, what he's found by taking gut biopsies from individuals um, as long as three months after symptom onset, these are people who have recovered, they have uh, no virus in their nasal swabs, uh, but if he, he takes gut biopsies and stains for SARS-CoV-2 antigen, he can find cells, this is in the uh, duodenum of these individuals, individual cells that appear to be positive for virus. Um, they're not present uh, in the um, pre-illness uh, uh, gut biopsy. So this suggests that there's a degree of persistence in SARS-CoV-2 replication. And he finds this in about one third of the 15 or so individuals that he's looked at, um, persistence of virus that might explain this maturation of the antibody response. Um, uh, to this maturation process. And the way we did this is we, um, we worked with Surab Mahandur, there was a collaboration. He was a gastroenterologist and scientist at Mount Sinai. And I think that, that came more out of an informal conversation with him because he had the observation that um, once the healthcare system started seeing or having regular procedures again, that if he had um, individuals who would come in for endoscopies um, and who were recovered from COVID-19, um, you required a, a, a negative COVID test, right, to enter the hospital. So they were all PCR negative. Huh. Um, but when you took gastrointestinal biopsies, um, for other reasons, he also looked at some of them um, in his lab and he did a staining for uh, nuclear proteins, for, for SARS-CoV-2 nuclear proteins. And what he saw is that um, he actually could detect in some of those individuals, um, even three to four months after the um, infection, would still see some viral proteins um, in, the, in the gut epithelia. And so that was just an interesting observation that, that might as well um, help explain why you have those, when you have those persistent viral fragments that might explain such maturation processes. I'm going to pretend that didn't happen. What contribution that uh, apparently ongoing replication in the gut makes to the uh, antibody maturation, we're just going to have to wait and see. It is something that... Um, Saurabh and Michelle and we will be studying in the future. Apparently ongoing replication in the gut. Apparently. Mimi, do you unmute? Oh, sorry. Today I'm gonna show you how to do a 
share some data about SARS-CoV-2 um, infection and persistence in intestinal tissues um, up to seven months after resolution of acute illness. From this imaging, we noticed that the cells in which antigen or presumptive viral particles were identified appeared to have a goblet cell-like morphology. So we next sought to further define the epithelial subtypes with co-localizing viral products. Nucleocapsid, again, in green, and MUC2 in red. MUC2 is an intestinal mucin produced by goblet cells. So there are scant nucleocapsid positive cells that are not positive for MUC2, shown by these arrows here, but the majority of them were MUC2 positive, shown here. Viral association with goblet cells was also seen by electron tomography. This panel shows a tomographic reconstruction of goblet cells in both the duodenum and in the ilia with uh, presumptive virons within these membrane-bound compartments. And then here is our magnified images. To more definitively confirm that these viral particles are SARS-CoV-2, we began performing immuno-EM. Here. So this panel shows one of these presumptive viral particles denoted by this asterisk, and then spike protein is the, are these dark black or brown dots. Nice.